live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters. You're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. All right, all right. Welcome again, gentlemen, to yet another episode of the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. My name is Scott McKay, at Scott McKay on Twitter and Clubhouse. Real Scott McKay on Instagram. You can look up our YouTube videos by searching my name on YouTube. Mountaintoppodcast.com is the URL, as always. And I invite you to join us on Facebook at the Mountaintop Summit. Gentlemen, it's a different kind of Facebook group. It isn't everybody bitching and complaining about their girlfriends and their job and people giving bad advice to each other. We relax. Have some fun and talk about guy stuff on this particular Facebook group. I promise once you join, you're going to enjoy it very, very much. With me today is a guy I've known about for years and mutually so. And for some reason, we just never connected. I think we've even shared the stage here and there, uh, either virtually or even in person. But he is a teacher of men on how to be better with women. His name is Robbie Kramer, and he is from Inner Confidence, and he currently hails in Tulum, Mexico, but he bides his time between there and Kiev, Ukraine. Robbie, welcome into the show. Thanks, Scott. Great to be here. Yeah, man. And I just finished recording a show uh, for you on your podcast, and we had a great time talking about all sorts of things. And some of that's going to carry over today because the topic we're going to address, I mean, we're going to hit this thing with a big, heavy hammer, I'm sure, because you're equally, if not more passionate about this than I am. But we're going to talk about basically women all over the world, single men traveling abroad and dating and finding love abroad. And of course, you know, we can make jokes about broads here, but you know, uh, (laughs) we're going to be a little bit more politically correct than that. Needlessly. So it's just an old joke. So anyway, uh, you have a girlfriend in your life, right? I do. She is a Ukrainian uh, export currently in, <laughs> in Tulum, yeah, but uh, we've been uh, we've been together for about six months, and I'm uh, very confident she is the one, and that means a lot coming from me, given my background <laughs> and Playboy esque lifestyle for the past, uh, you know, shit, twenty years almost. I'm thirty eight now, so. Yeah. Well, you know, I married the woman of my dreams when I was 40 and I met her when I was 39 and I had been married previously. And these guys know that whole sordid story. But uh, nonetheless, I had several years where I sowed the royal oats and uh, had a little fun with women and dated around. You know, I'm treating them with respect, of course. But uh, I think it's a rite of passage for us guys to date some women and build our skills and see who's out there so we can better find out who it is. We really want to be with, but you know, you and I were laughing yesterday about the number of guys from the pickup artist era who swore off marriage and were such playboys and getting laid and running pickup boot camps. And nowadays, 15 years later, they're married to one woman with two or three kids and they're still trying to sell their books from 2005 and are (laughs) kind of laying low, keeping it on the DL. You know, pretending that didn't happen. (laughs) Totally. Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, you laughed yesterday when we were getting to know each other about how I was always kind of like that fox in the hen house in the pickup seduction community because I was happily married to one woman and that kind of didn't add up. Yet I was teaching guys how to get better with women. It was always about authenticity even before it was cool to talk about it that way. And yet, you know, here you and I both are. We both have a great woman in our life and we're both living proof of concept, if you will, that, uh, you know – uh, once you find a great woman, you've got your partner in crime, as they so often like to say in online dating profiles nowadays, and you're just off and running. So I think that's great, man. It's I can't tell you how much more productive I've been. I'm in the best shape I've been in probably forever. Um, and when you're not focusing on new women 24-7, there's so much extra time to do other things. Not to say that all that time spent on chasing new women wasn't insanely valuable. Like I wouldn't trade that for anything. I wouldn't be able to have this relationship if it wasn't for all that experience. But it's really nice to kind of, you know, retire in a sense. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I went to a therapist actually when I was dealing with a potential breakup like eight years ago. And I explained my situation. I explained I'm also a dating coach. He's like, you know, you kind of sound like a a professional athlete who's just not ready to retire yet. And I'm like, huh, yeah, I guess that's a good way to put it. So I broke up with my girlfriend the next day and then <laughs> ended up getting back in the singles ground. But, but yeah. 
It's so curious that you would bring it up in that context, because that's exactly how I've talked about it. I mean, I got so good at online dating, Robbie, that I just had mastered it. I mean, mm -hmm. I was getting all the women to go out with me. I was sure that no other guy in my entire metro area of San Antonio was as good at this stuff as I was. And then when I met Emily, all of a sudden, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not doing online dating anymore. But I was so good at it. It's hard to gain yeah. skills like that and all of a sudden just be left orphaned with them. And I kind of no. felt like that NBA <laughs> player, you know, like Jason Kidd, you know, sort of around that time period who suddenly wasn't an NBA player anymore because he was older and replaced by younger guys and retired from the sport. And so what does he do? He coaches. Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm kind of like that old bull on the hill. And I've always been that old bull on the hill ever since I've for my entire tenure as a coach, because I had this woman in my life. But the beauty of it is I got to continue doing online dating by helping other guys figure out how to do it. And you have to be a, your clients. <laughs> right. I'm still writing like I'm, all the, yeah. I'm still writing all these first emails and helping guys with their profile. And I'm absolutely leveraging all these skills. And the scary part is, Robbie, that 15 years later, I'm 10 times as good at it as I was when I was doing it. Right. Yeah. I, I'm constantly responding to my uh, private clients about, you know, text messages and same thing, online dating messages. I feel like I'm actively messaging like a hundred women at once. None of them I'm <laughs> seeing, sure. but I'm actively yeah. Oh, yeah. messaging them. So my skills is the same as you. They're just getting more and more sharp every day that goes by that I'm not dating. Right. In a way, you feel like you're vicariously experiencing being single still. I mean, I still get to have a match.com membership and everything, although I'm not dating. You know, I, I never had to give up the skills and I love helping other guys succeed at this because I'm very happy with how my life turned out. And of course, I want to help all the other guys and women too to find love in their own right and to do it the right way. And it seems like you and I are on the same page about that. And hearkening back to what you said a few minutes ago about kind of doing the dating thing and then becoming married. And all of a sudden, here we are, guys who are still coaching single guys. And, you know, I coach some married guys, guys in relationships as well, as well as women, like I said. Uh, but it's funny how people will say, wait a minute, you're a married guy or you're in a relationship. What do you know about dating? Right. As if you don't right. know what you're doing because you're not actively dating. I think that's one thing that made made you pretty controversial when I first heard about you. This is way back in 2007, I think. They're like, have you, you heard about that Scott McKay guy? He's like a pickup artist with his wife, but he's he's married. I'm like, <laughs> these are some like, you know, layer guys back in the day. Yeah. And, in, and that's how I first heard about you kind of as like you were the controversial guy who wasn't single teaching this stuff. And I'm like, well, that makes more sense. Like he's already achieved what <laughs> – most guys are trying to get hey, to. a little controversy <laughs> took me a long way. We're still here, oh, yeah. right? You and I both. <laughs> but you know what I was going to say is there was this weird dichotomy going on because for every person who thought I was completely incompetent and should, you know, sit down and STFU, <laughs> there was someone else who would say to some of the other guys, I know some of the prominent dating coaches who weren't pickup guys, but maybe were coaching women. Uh, yeah. Like there was a guy at the time who actively said, Hey, I've never been in a successful relationship for over two months, but I'm going to teach all these women how to find a husband. And people were ragging on him because it's like, <laughs> well, you know, if you're such a great dating coach, why are you still single? So mm -hmm. for every person who thought I was, a total joke or some kind of charlatan because I was married doing this. There was someone else who was like, wait a minute, you're still single over there. You know, what do you know right. about this? Cause otherwise you'd have a wife or a girlfriend if you were such a genius. Yep. So the joke that I always cracked was there was this window of time during the four months I was engaged where I was good at this. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> the rest of it, you know, either side of the ledger from there <laughs> disaster. Totally. Right. <laughs> I'm going to totally steal that when I'm engaged soon. <laughs> Milk it just, it first. just, it just shows you how ridiculous the whole idea is. Either you're good with women or you're not. And what you choose to do with that, as long as it's based on having many options and it's what you actually want to do instead of either defaulting to what you don't want to do because you're desperate or you know being roped into it by some chick who just wants to lock you down, as long as you're making your own decisions, whether you're pro-marriage, not pro-marriage, whether you want to be 
living the playboy lifestyle for the rest of your life. A lot of times guys misunderstand that about me, Robbie. I'm not trying to impose what I do on anybody else. I had a guy come to me from the United Arab Emirates who wanted to add a third wife to his harem. I was like, okay, I think I can help with that. Sure. You know, I have guys who want to get into circles, bisexual circles, and add two or three new women to their lifestyle. I can help with that too. There's guys and there are guys who indeed don't ever want to get married. They want to date as many women at once. And they're perhaps somewhat surprised when I can help them with that also. Uh, and of course, people come to me and they want to get married. Women want to get married and they may not want to have the same kind of marriage I do. And that's all fine also. So the good news is a lot of these particular skills with women are natural. They're replicable. But in many ways, you can apply them so many different ways to so many different lifestyles, can't you? I mean, that's the beauty of this stuff. You know, you really are building a skill. And I love to compare it to an athletic sort of endeavor. Like I I felt that becoming great with women was the same as or more similar to becoming a great golfer or hockey player or other, you know, sporting things. I'm I'm a sports guy. I've always loved sports. And a lot of guys will get into this and they'll kind of treat it like studying for uh, school or or for a advanced graduate degree but it's more of a physical activity you got to go out you got to flirt you got to approach people and building the habits of it like a physical activity was the thing that really allowed me to basically it, it allowed me to really improve at the fastest rate possible that's quite an insight I think that's absolutely 100% valid. You think of all these guys, especially the guys who are like in very left-brained professions, uh, certainly engineers and guys who code software. But one thing I've noticed also is, you know, as many cultural jokes we have or stereotypes even, funny or not, about women wanting to marry a doctor, you know, Mm -hmm. doctors are very left-brained and they often have tremendous issues relating to women and being fun and charming as do pilots by the way you know, yeah i think a fighter pilot would get all the women in the world and many do but a lot of those guys are very left-brained and and um socializing with women isn't the easiest thing for them to do so you get these situations certainly like mystery method was known to be and genius in many respects by the way and how it made the idea of relating to women very tangible to left yeah, guys. Which is what they needed because it seemed like some totally abstract <laughs> foreign concept. But with a model, it's like, oh, okay, my brain can wrap my head around this stuff. Right. But it was very much, like you said, a course of study. Right. Like we're going to build our knowledge in doing this. And once we know how to connect tab A to slot B or whatever, uh, then we'll know what we're doing. And what you're saying, and I agree with very much, is that this is more practical than having book smarts, per se. I mean, this is what they used to call being a keyboard jockey, right? You could talk about this and go to your lair meetings, as you mentioned before, and uh, get on forums. But none of these guys are actually going out and talking to women. And dare I say this, because it's going to be a little controversial, but I think that's kind of what's happening nowadays with – uh, political correctness and wokeness is you have a bunch of liberal white people talking to each other about how black people and, you know, Mexicano people and Asian people want to be treated. And it would be a lot more useful to go actually hang out with some people who aren't like you and figure out <laughs> who the hell they are and what they're about and what their sensibilities are and what's important to them and start building some mutual respect. But people make it a book smart thing. And Look at the beauty there, man. We just created this perfect segue to talking about women internationally. We did. Yeah. And uh, no, I love what you said about that because it's true. People are just hanging out on on these Facebook groups and wasting all their time discussing this shit and they have no idea. You know, They haven't even met these people. They're not even hanging out with them. And, no. uh, oh, for sure. 100%. Yeah. And to also to make the segue <laughs> a little bit uh, – I could add to it, for me, what really allowed me to hit that next level of success with women was, uh, I guess you could say with air quotes, taking my game on the road and leaving the U.S., traveling abroad, meeting women from tons of different places, different cultures, different languages, and seeing if I could succeed in those areas. And what I learned was just totally mind-boggling, like the way to be successful with women in Eastern Europe. In a lot of ways, it's like 
polar opposite, not in terms of the the pillars of being an attractive man, but the sort some of the more sort of practical ways of communication and what they're expecting was so radically different. It was just such a cool experience. I learned so much from. Yeah, you know, I'm sitting here thinking as you're talking, how come nobody had this light bulb go on in their head such that they would leverage the terms home game and away game during the pickup cars there? <laughs> Because what you're saying is absolutely right. I mean, taking your game on the road is like, okay, you think you're good at this. Let's play an away game. Let's go to somebody else's house and see if we can still have the same kind of skills that we think we have. I think that's valid. And yet at the same time, as much as you're saying you can go to Ukraine and it's sort of dramatically different in terms of how you play the game or the cultural trappings of it. One thing I've noticed, Robbie, is when it comes down to masculinity and femininity, the essence of it, it's an international language rather like mathematics. I mean, you go to another country. I've been to a lot of countries. So have you, we're not going to bore people with numbers there, but let's just say for the benefit of this audience, you're extremely well-traveled in your own right. Wouldn't you agree that women are feminine? And men are, well, a lot of men are confused about what masculinity means all over the world, but masculinity and femininity and that natural set of building blocks that create sexual polarity are universal, like one plus one equals two, like physics. 100%. Yeah. 100%. And that's what allows you to go somewhere, not speak a single word of that language and be successful with the women because that that shit doesn't matter when you've got the big pillars down like having a masculine presence and being a confident, you know, <laughs> interesting guy. Uh not just interesting in terms of what you talk about, but having that groundedness, that presence, that solidity to who you are, how you carry yourself, your body language, your fashion, all those things that you can say non-verbally, women are going to eat you up and even more so because you're you're foreign, you're new, you're exciting. And you see it all the time as as an American. I mean, I couldn't – I was getting so sick and tired of the Australian guys coming down to San Diego where I lived as a university student. And they would just <laughs> clean up. Yeah, and right. <laughs> Obviously, they had the accent. That, you know, I'd see other guys come that would barely speak any English at all. And these guys were crushing me. You know, I'm learning about all this stuff as a, as a golf nerd <laughs> back in my early 20s. Uh, so, yeah, when I took my game on the road, I kind of got to – to be in that opposite position, which is a lot more interesting. It's funny. A guy hired me to coach him one time and he, and he was coming from London and he had a Londoner British accent, which is very engaging. Mm -hmm. And he needed to move for work to Oklahoma where there aren't a whole lot of British guys. And he had a concern about being able to attract American women and whether they were going to like him or be charmed by him. I said, yeah, I think you're good. Just, just say stuff. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Step number one, talk. (laughs) Right. I just had a guy in my podcast, actually, who literally said that. He's like, you know, I was a dork in high school. Didn't really – girls didn't like me. Wasn't having much luck. And then I came to the U.S. And all I had to do was talk. And it, everything was different. I was like the most popular guy ever. So Now, that said, crazy. there are certain accents that are charming to American women. And then there are certain accents that are negatively stereotyped by American women. Like, and there's a guy from Russia and a guy from mainland China and a guy from India out there listening to this going, yeah, a lot of good that does me. (laughs) Right. The guy from Brazil or Italy or Spain or Australia or England who's getting all the women. And it's really unfair. And one thing I can say to kind of level the playing field is you and I as Americans, uh, some places we go when we speak like an American, it doesn't help us. Other places, it's wildly charming to women. It can go either way when you're an yeah. American, can it? I've found that the only place where it, where people are like, whoa, I love your accent. The only time I've ever heard that uh, was in Australia, for whatever reason. They like American accents there. And when I speak, I'm a horrible Russian speaker, but I'm learning it. But when I speak Russian in you know, Russia or Ukraine, They say, oh, your accent's cute, but I don't speak well enough to even really know. So, (laughs) but most of the time I feel like it's just kind of, it's just kind of even, like it's not a advantage or a disadvantage, but the fact that I'm American in many places is a huge advantage. But yeah, totally. I I do feel bad for the guys that have Asian accents, Indian accents, because those are kind of universally looked upon as not attractive. And unfortunately, totally. And I've had, I've had Asian and Indian clients with really bad accents and I've encouraged them to work with speech pathologists and eliminate their accent because it makes a big difference. 
well, you know, they have elocution coaches. You don't have to send them to a doctor to cure this disease. You know, they can be coached. But again, I think it's all about embracing who you are. And, you know, certain women are going to be more amenable to a different kind of accent than others. There are certain guys in you know, there are certain guys who are kind of like Latka from the old uh, taxi TV show where nobody could figure out where they're from. You know, and usually those guys are either from Israel or Turkey or somewhere in Eastern Europe, maybe, perhaps, although that starts to sound a little Russian. But that kind of foreign accent that's inconclusive has, I think, more allure than otherwise um, here in the United States. But anyway, enough about that. Uh, as far as going overseas, you mentioned something that I think is a fantastic takeaway these guys have to take with them from this show. And it's this. If you are American, even if you're Canadian, and you're listening to this show, and you're going to go abroad and seek to meet women, our first and indeed very arrogant instinct is let's find people who speak English. Anybody who's an American or a Canadian, I dare say, native English speaker, because English is so ubiquitous in the world, if we make an effort like you have to learn that other language before we're, you know, even visiting another place, let alone being immersed in it, oh my gosh, how women are incredibly charmed by an English speaking man who learns their language. It's the biggest panty dropper ever. <laughs> oh, and, and guys don't even realize this. You know, it's kind of counterintuitive, but I speak fluent Spanish and have for 25 years. And when I go places where Spanish is spoken and I start speaking Spanish to women, they just, like you said, they think the accent is cute. And, uh, you know, they'll say, oh, man, got the mucho, you know, <laughs> like it's just so charming mm -hmm. to me. And, of course, I, I've been accused of talking like a Mexican-American English speaker in South America. It's like it's so weird, dude. You're an American, and I can hear your American accent, but you also sound like a Mexican because you're talking to me in Mexican Spanish. Um, that's what I've learned and what I've been immersed in. So when I go to a place like Colombia or Ecuador or someplace like that, people are just confused, but they're still intrigued. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's right. a huge, huge takeaway right there is learn the damn language. Oh, my God. I mean, it's 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 a sign of respect, you know, especially if you're going to be there for a while. I, I run into – I live in Kiev, Ukraine most of the time when the weather isn't horrible like during the winter. Then I escape to Tulum or somewhere else nice. But when I first moved to Kiev, I got horrible advice from a friend of mine who lived there who was of Ukrainian descent who basically grew up there. But he went to – you know, he split his time between the U.S. and Ukraine. But he moved there after he, he finished the army. In the U.S. Army, moved to Ukraine, and obviously he speaks perfectly fluent Ukrainian and Russian. He's like, yeah, don't bother learning Russian. It's going to take you forever. You're not going to need it. Everyone speaks English. And that was just horrible advice because I just looked like another idiot sex tourist. And there's so many sex tourists in Kiev that the women kind of use whether or not you can speak a little bit of Russian or Ukrainian as a litmus test. So once I started learning it, I no longer had that you know, stereotype or red flag on my shirt. And it made a huge difference. It's just a sign of respect. And you learn so much more about the culture being able to speak the damn language, of course. Yes, 100% agreed. And, you know, as you're talking, it brings to mind all those extremely cringeworthy moments where my wife and I have been traveling overseas and we've observed at perhaps close range American sex tourists working their gig. Oh my God, it's mm -hmm. worthy. There's these old creepy guys who aren't getting any success with women in their native country and they have hired someone to be an escort. We saw this in Hong Kong and we've seen it in the Philippines. Uh, we've seen it in Thailand where this girl just doesn't want to be there. She can't get out of there fast enough. We've seen the escort owning the man in public and him just being Mr. Nice Guy and being desperate. And it is. It's completely cringeworthy. It's cringeworthy. It's yeah. one of the most cringeworthy things you see when traveling. And you know, mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier, briefly, we kind of just sort of touched upon this issue, but I think it's something that if we don't cover, guys are going to wonder why we didn't. There's this whole mail order bride thing. I need to go to Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine is a hot spot for this. The women are very flirty and they're very beautiful. It's a fact. It's not myth. That's not yep. hype. Um, Colombia, Philippines, uh, Russian brides, and guys think, well, you know what? I'm going to go find myself a wife over there. And what ends up happening is these are guys who are scapegoating their own culture 
in favor mm-hmm. of going somewhere else and trying to find a woman. For example, a guy here in the United States may think, oh, well, they're all just raging feminists who hate men here and they're too independent and finding an American woman who would be a good wife is impossible nowadays, which of course it is not impossible. Of course not. And they have no social skill and they're turning women off. And then what happens is they go to Russia and as you correctly mentioned, there's a language barrier and they find themselves better at attracting women when those women don't know what the hell they're talking about because they can't embarrass themselves or right. say something stupid. So now mm-hmm. without language, there's no language barrier. Without any language barrier, I don't look as socially inept. There was, again, let's use the word cringeworthy. There was a very cringeworthy documentary several years ago that followed the journeys of four or five guys as they went after a mail order bride. And these guys were just, let's just say they all needed a whole lot of self-work before yeah. they were going to do what I refer to as deserving what they want. And it was just so obvious that these guys felt like they had to go get a woman who was either desperate for a green card or just wouldn't be able to detect how awful a guy they were in order to get a woman to marry them. And that's wrong headed. That's not why you want to go to another country, meet the women, learn more about their way of doing things, make a new friend, uh, discover a new culture. Uh, Yeah, being a sex tourist is creepy. And the only thing creepier is feeling like you got to go to another country and take advantage of some woman because you can't do well with women here. It's like I've told guys and women in New York or Los Angeles, hey, look, you know what? If you feel like you've got to go outside your metro area to find someone to fall in love with – you don't need to go anywhere. You need to look in the mirror because if you can't find totally. someone who's going to enjoy you and your company and fall in love with you for who you are in a metro area of 20 million people, it's not going to magically improve when you go elsewhere. Definitely not. And I'm gl- really glad you brought that up because you do see that so often, especially in Eastern Europe. You see these guys, you see it down in the Philippines too and Thailand. Um, you see these guys and they're just like totally this is obvious sex tourists. And even if they do find a girl, I think the – whether you want to call it karma or not really karma, it's just kind of like their lack of getting that part of their life handled or their inability to get that part of their life handled and the hack that they're trying to then use of finding a girl in spite of their lack of social skills, social awareness, confidence. Those women usually end up taking that guy for a ride a lot of the time. That's what I've seen. Um, those relationships end really poorly. The guy brings a girl over to the U.S. and she divorces him, takes his money. There's just all sorts of horror stories I've heard. I've met a lot of guys in Ukraine also who are like, dude, if you find a Ukrainian girl, don't take her back to the U.S. Because if you do, you know, you'll spoil her and this and that and the other. I'm like, you guys are just idiots with no social skills. And that's why you're saying that because you went over here just to find a girl because you couldn't get one back at home. So – that's a, a really important point. You can't solve the problem by simply shopping in a different area. Well, none of that pretends a long-term, happy, successful relationship where we mutually respect each other, get each other, and are happy to be with each other. Quite the opposite. Exactly. <laughs> yes. What have you learned traveling all over the world, meeting all different kinds of women that we haven't talked about yet? I just want you to riff on it for a while. Yeah. I I mean, the first one is eye contact. I can't emphasize eye contact enough. And that was one of like the last things that I really even bothered to, for whatever reason, kind of focus on. And I don't know why. Maybe it was just like we mentioned earlier in the call, just all the stuff that I was studying when it came to dating advice and all the stuff out there. But being able to confidently hold a woman's gaze, not just that, but being able to communicate with your eyes And at least show her that you're comfortable with her, that she turns you on. There's so much that can be said with eye contact. But if you're afraid to communicate in that way or you don't know how to, you're really missing out on everything. Because foreign women communicate way more with eye contact than what I found with American women. Like when I went over to Poland, it was just insane, the the amount of eye contact that women would give me. And I think obviously different cultures all have different amounts of eye contact But just for some reason, leaving the U.S., it was just a huge difference. I don't know if you experienced that, but that was the biggest thing right off the bat. Yeah, I can relate to that. I would agree with that. Yeah. So eye contact was a big one. Another thing that just in terms of traveling and and realizing I could do was 
just the whole idea of living kind of the nomadic lifestyle, unplugging from the U.S., learning about different cultures. I wanted to – I didn't want to just go on these little like one or two-week trips. I wanted to really immerse myself. So after I spent the summer traveling abroad, I went all through Europe in 2012, rented a car with my buddy and basically did a giant lap of Europe. Uh, I was like, I have got to get back here and I want to come back for a longer period of time. So I put my place on Airbnb and the the money I was able to make from just renting out my place was enough to cover most of my trip because when you go abroad, things are way cheaper. You know, if you're making U.S. dollars and you're spending the local currency, you're usually doing very well, especially in a lot of these countries where, uh, you know, they're a little bit less developed like Ukraine or Colombia or a lot of the places down in South America, Eastern Europe. So it's just such a – it's a great – opportunity to not just meet women, improve your social skills. Uh, you can save money in the process. You can use that money to come back and, you know, invest in other things. Like basically when I, I was living in New York and I, I tracked my expenses, I was making around 2013, I think I made 150K and I spent 150K. And then the next year when I went over to Eastern Europe, I made the same amount, but I spent 50K. So that extra 100K in my pocket was a big boost in not just my confidence, but my lifestyle, my investments. So that's the other thing that, that traveling affords you is you, people think they've got to do it. You know, it's going to cost them an arm and a leg. And if you do it right, you're going to save money doing it. So that's, quite I mean, that's just the, yeah. So it, it, in my opinion, you're kind of crazy not to. If you're a single young guy that doesn't have the responsibilities of a family or even if you have a mortgage, you know, you could find a way to rent out your place. Like there's no better time to do that. And that's really what I wanted to take advantage of when I was in my early 30s. I'm like, if I don't do this now, you know, maybe I'll do it later when I'm older. But I don't, I don't want to wait to be like my grandparents who aren't traveling the world until they're on a cruise ship in their 60s or 70s. What Tim Ferriss calls the deferred life plan, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Hell with that. I am so glad. And this is a takeaway for all you guys who are listening. You know, we think we have to spend money on stuff that's lasting, like a home and cars, experiences, experiences, experiences. Nobody can repossess my world travel. Nope. Ever. <laughs> and man, I am so thrilled. I went and had a lot of those adventures while I was young and healthy instead of old and decrepit, you know? And we've seen all these groups of people who are old retirees and they could barely get off the bus and they're seeing the pyramids for the first time, you know? You know, life is so backwards sometimes. They say youth is wasted on the young. So, yeah, I mean, anything we can do to beg, bar, or steal to get out and see the world now while we can still enjoy it, you know, that's great. Yeah, anyway, the gig you were mentioning about Airbnb reminds me of something that was being marketed several years ago now. I just was reminded of it as you talked. And the hook was you can own this exotic car like an Audi R8 or a Lambo and have somebody else pay for it. You don't need any money. Mm -hmm. And what it was, was you buy the car and put it on like a 10-year note and then rent it out three or four days a month. And that pays your monthly bill on it. And Tried was, it. Yeah, well, you <laughs> did try it. Oh, maybe you have a story to tell maybe on another podcast. But man, it sounds like yeah. what you're doing with, you know, what you're doing in terms of your domicile, it's a lot less of a depreciation hit rather than letting some guy rent your car who doesn't care about it and bake the living stew out of it and hand it back to you the next day with 200 miles on it and in need of new tires and new piston rings, you know? Totally. Yeah, I've done it with cars. I've done it with houses. It's definitely better with houses. Yeah, Don't that do the seemed car like thing. a bad idea from my <laughs> somewhat more mature mindset as an age 44, 45-year-old guy hearing about it than I'm sure it would have sounded to a 22-year-old. Um, what would you tell these guys listening, Robbie, who have maybe become a little jaded thinking, you know what, here in the Western world, all the women are spoiled. They're all displaying way too much masculine energy. I'm just not going to find a good woman here. I need to go somewhere else to find a decent woman. What would you tell those guys? Uh, it's, it's just crazy. I mean, the, the one thing about American girls kind of worldwide that, that you come to realize is American girls are probably the most fun cool chicks out there on a whole. Of course, if you're in the MGTOW communities or you're spending all this time exactly. looking for those sorts of evidence, you're going to find it. You know, it's like you, you think about a purple BMW bus and you're going to see, you know, BMW buses around, right? It's just kind of the, <laughs> yeah. the way it works. So, 
But so, you know, what we focus on expands, obviously. And it's just horse shit. Like, if, if you don't think you can find a cool American chick, then it's clear that you, like you said earlier, you need to look in the mirror. You're probably not a cool American guy. You're probably some weird guy doing some weird shit. I don't know what the hell, but there's so many cool chicks out there. And likewise for other cultures, like there's a, a lot of really hot Ukrainian girls, but there's also a ton of downsides with some of these cultures in, in terms of the way of th- that they think as well, in terms of the socioeconomic standpoint. Like what <laughs> one thing that American guys really kind of learn as a – just as a wake-up call is when they go – elsewhere especially places in eastern europe and women expect them to pay for everything which is just standard over there they start thinking like oh god i kind of like the the american girls who are more open to <laughs> to bust out the checkbook i've always been a, of the impression like listen if, if i'm going to take a girl out on the date i'm going to pay um that's just how i like to do things and that usually ends up pretty good but yeah no matter where you go there's going to be women that had other negative qualities that you're not going to like so trying to hack the system just doesn't really work. If you can't succeed in the U.S., you're not going to succeed abroad. And I didn't really leave the U.S. until I was having a ton of success at home. And that's what allowed me to really have fun and enjoy travel and have all the insights that I had. And then eventually, you know, I've dated all sorts of women. I even had an American girlfriend travel with me to Kiev. We had an amazing time over there. Um, and a lot of guys say, you can't bring an American girl here. They'll, they won't like it. And she loved it. Uh, so I brought an American girl there. I was married yeah. to her, but we enjoyed Kiev and Ukraine in general massively. Totally. All the American girls I brought love it. And they've fallen in love with the Ukrainian girls. They love the Ukrainian guys too. So yeah, there's just a lot of nonsensical thinking out there. Well, it sounds like you're discussing what's classically known as the greener grass syndrome. Whatever you're not yes. doing sounds like the better idea. Meanwhile, back here in the United States, I couldn't agree more that if you're having a hard time with all of these women and there's a pattern to it, you know, the hard truth is you do have to look in the mirror. And that's a huge takeaway for these guys. If you're seeing consistent patterns of failure with women, I can guarantee the good news is it is your fault. You know, there's a lot of it's not your fault marketing, but the good news mm-hmm. is you have control over that and you can change it. The one thing I'll also add, uh, is overseas, American women are viewed through the filter of Hollywood and therefore seen as very slutty and sexually liberal. And a lot of women who are, you know, nice girls, even church girls go overseas and guys are thinking they're just going to be little sluts. And it's very off-putting to American women. So there's that stereotype. And again, it is a cultural stereotype for sure. It really is. For sure. Hey, to end this show, let's do something fun for these guys. Let's do a lightning round of the most underrated and overrated countries for women. Okay. Awesome. And I will go. I'll go first. Go. You go first. Absolutely. Have at it. I was going to take the pressure off you, but if you're ready, go for it. Go for it. (laughs) Vietnam is number one on my list for that. Amazing women. Underrated. Oh my God. Especially if you're an American, because for whatever reason, the Vietnamese have have forgiven us for our ridiculous treatment of them during the war. More so in the southern part than the northern part, with that caveat. Yes, that's true. Um, I, I was in Ho Chi Minh City. Also, I was in um, Hanoi. Um, and women over there, they're, they're amazing. Food is great, very feminine, and beautiful. I think some of the most beautiful Asians are Vietnam. So extremely cheap, too. Love Vietnam. Underrated for me would be Belarus, which very few Westerners go to. And the Republic of Georgia and Armenia, which, of course, is nestled right in there between Turkey and Western Asia. And I just could not believe how hot the women are in those countries. I've also have not been to Iran, but I've heard that Iranian women who call themselves Persian when they're here in the West are just fantastically beautiful. I second you on Georgia, uh, the Republic of Georgia, especially if you like to ski. It has amazing skiing kind of a Colorado or California quality. Well, yeah, I mean, for sure, it's an underrated country in general, but specifically the women. Oh, right. Yeah. Just specifically the women. This question's only about women? Okay. Yes, yes, uh, yes, for sure. Okay. Um, overrated. Uh, overrated. I would say Bali is very overrated. You know, it's funny. I don't mean to steal your thunder, but you think of island girls and you go to Bali and there are none. Yeah. There's really not. It's it's just all tourists for the most part. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and and Good one. it's Good very tough to compete there. 
because it's right in the backyard of Australia, and Australian dudes are some of the toughest to compete with in the world. They're alpha, they're masculine, they're funny. Good luck in Bali. You know, I have to share with you a brief little story about Bali. We took our children there, and my son was five, and we went to a very, very kid-friendly resort. If any of you guys want to know what it is, let me know, and I'll tell you. And there were a bunch of little children, the vast majority of whom were Australians and Kiwis, okay? My son was the only American, and he just cleaned up with the little Australian girls. Oh, my God. They just followed him around because he talked like the television. <laughs> oh, my son felt like king of the freaking hill in Bali. It was so funny. I mean, one little Australian girl left the resort before we did, and she demanded that she see my son before she left. And it was like a tearful goodbye. And, oh, my God, you know. And her parents and Emily and I were looking at each other like, okay. And even my son was like, well, yeah, I'll miss you, I guess. But, you know, have, have a nice trip home, whatever, you know. But so true. It kind of was the reverse of that language, uh, you know, that accent effect. Yeah, but totally. But anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's that's yeah. I, I mean, I can only imagine your son when well, he's thirteen, right? When he's he is now. <laughs> when yes, he's this was eight. five. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, wow, he's always okay. been a little mag daddy. How could he not be? Your son will be someday too. I promise. He'll take after. Definitely overrated. You know, you hear about South America a lot, uh, Brazil. And Colombia, gorgeous women. Peru, not at all. You know, one, one friend not. of mine told me everybody in Peru Bolivia, is like Scotty not at all. Bolivia, not <laughs> they <at> do. <laughs> um, you know, apologies to Peruvians out there, but come on, definite resemblance there. I think Argentinian women are very hot. And of course, we just talked about the tango in Argentina and the romanticized notion of that on this show, which is true. But I just, I don't think they're my type. I don't think Argentinian women are my type, but you know. Argentinians are very difficult. Even Argentinian guys I know bash on their women. And they say their women are <laughs> titled and kind of, you know, arrogant, bitchy women out there. And I'm, you know, <laughs> I've, I don't think I've ever, maybe I was with one Argentinian, but on the whole, I mean, I kind of have to agree. <laughs> And they always wear those big platform shoes. If you see three girls together, yeah. It's yeah, a, a little, a little style disconnect there. Um, yeah. <laughs> that brings up another little funny anecdote. I went to the Soviet Union in 1986, and I grew up here, and we were propagandized as kids against thinking anything could possibly be going on that's good behind the Iron Curtain. I mean, I kind of saw it like the Wizard of Oz. You know, everything that took place in Kansas was in black and white, and then the Wizard of Oz was in living color. I kind of just, in my mind, pictured everything behind the Iron Curtain as being in black and white. And I took this trip to the Soviet Union in 1986 – and I could not believe how beautiful the girls were. And none of them had any style. I mean, they were all wearing combat boots and gray coats in the wintertime, but they were all gorgeous girls. And I was like, huh, you know, so much for the stereotype, right? This is, this is amazing. I would say anywhere in the Middle East or Eastern Europe is probably still underrated as far as how beautiful the women are. Turkish women are gorgeous. Overrated women, French women. I mean, cute accent and everything, but I just have not seen a whole lot of beautiful female human beings in France. I've seen more in Germany than in France, frankly. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. Also, a place, I wouldn't really call it either overrated or underrated, but a very difficult place to have success is Israel. And I'm Jewish, so I've been to Israel a few times. And man, the Israeli women are beautiful, but... You rough know, around the edges. Very rough around the edges. Very tough. They do, you know, they'll back turn you. They will give you the harshest rejections I've seen anywhere in the world. They've and, all been and, soldiers. Yeah, totally. That's probably That's the, the big reason why. Yeah. This is going to sound so lame, but another place that is underrated in terms of the beauty of the women, and again, the bar is probably set at zero here, but North Korea. I couldn't believe how many pretty girls I saw in North Korea. I mean, bless their hearts. They're all standardized into looking exactly alike. But, you know, you have to also remember I like short hair. And short hair on women is uh, preferred there, strangely enough. But I, I saw so many adorable women in North Korea. Isn't that something? That's, I mean, I, I'm... I was wanting to go for many reasons. I never thought the women would be uh, <laughs> one of those reasons. Well, but you will get zero interaction with them. I mean, don't yeah. believe anything you saw in a Seth Rogen movie, okay? You're not going <laughs> to interact with them. That isn't going to happen. I mean, right. nowadays, Americans can't even go, you know. Yeah. 
Uh, another, I wouldn't, I don't know. Well, definitely the women in Greece are overrated, uh, at least from, I think, the American sort of standpoint. When you go to Greece, you realize most Probably. women are pretty bad over there. Uh, they're a bit hairy, fat, <laughs> short on average. And yet Croatian women and Turkish women are all terrific. Totally. Yeah. Israeli women, no. Lebanese women, yes. Right. Croatian women are unbelievably gorgeous, tall, oh, just like yes. Serbian women. Sure. Very smart. If you have game, Serbia, Croatia, you're gonna you're gonna really enjoy it over there. Especially yes. Serbia. I, I would say Serbian women just on maybe on average are like the sort of if you're shopping for a wife, intelligent, hot, all around package. Serbian women are tough to beat, but Serbian men are also tough to compete with. So how about that? Well, you know they've had a tough, relatively recent history there too. Yeah. So there's a lot of mental toughness there. But yeah, I would say the former Yugoslavia in general is an underrated travel destination in the minds of Americans. For sure. People in Europe have long since figured it out, you know, that Dubrovnik and places like that are fantastic. But yeah, man, good stuff. I want to point these guys to your podcast. These guys who are listeners to this podcast will probably, well, most likely enjoy yours also. And Robbie's brand is Inner Confidence, but his podcast is called The Leverage Podcast. And I want to go ahead and send you guys a link that will let you sample that podcast for yourself. And that is mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Robbie, R-O-B-B-I-E. And you'll be able to listen to his show. And I got to tell you, Robbie, this has been a fantastic conversation and it wasn't quite what I expected. It exceeded my expectations. So thank you so much for joining us today, man. It's good to finally meet you and connect with you and have such a great conversation for these guys. Likewise, Scott. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. And guys, if you haven't been to mountaintoppodcast.com or haven't been in a long time, things are changing up there. There are some new goodies there for you, downloadable reports. You can check out YouTube videos. You can also get on my calendar and talk to me free for 25 minutes about what's going on in your life and the women you'd like to attract, whether that's in the good old US of A, Canada, anywhere in North America or anywhere else in the world. A lot of you guys from all over the world may not realize that I have probably visited your country and I might have something to add to to whether or not you're going to be attractive and successful with women, regardless of where in the world you are. This isn't just an American gig. And uh, like Robbie and I talked about here, it is really kind of a universal language is love and attraction. So uh, no matter where you are or who you are in this big wide world of ours, feel free to get on my calendar free for 25 minutes. Won't cost you a dime. You can talk to me directly and that's all there for you as well at mountaintoppodcast.com. Listen guys, the fellows over at origin in Maine, if you're involved with Brazilian jiu-jitsu, they have the coolest geese you've ever seen in your entire life. They have also uh, the kind of things you need to get more fit, kind of manly things like battle clubs and leather kettlebells, just so many cool things there at Origin in Maine that I rarely, if ever, talk about. When you go to mountaintoppodcast.com, click on the banner there for Origin in Maine and use Mountain 10 when you partake of any of those cool items or their amazing world-class jeans or any of the supplements from Origin Labs. Also, our friends over at Hero Soap not only have the most amazing soap you'll ever use, they're long-lasting. Uh, the ingredients aren't going to harm you. They aren't going to feminize you. They smell great. They attract women. You'll smell fantastic. You'll smell like a man. Uh, not only do they have that soap, but they also have body wash that is nothing like the stereotypical Axe stuff. And they also now have pet wash. So your pet can be as healthy and I don't know if it's going to smell like you or better or worse, but they do have the pet wash and you should try it. We have it here and we uh, wash our dog with it and uh, seems like a happy dog to me. And that's there for you also at mountaintoppodcast.com when you click on the Hero Soap banner. And likewise, you can use the Mountain 10 coupon to enjoy 10% off from those guys as well. And with that, until I talk to you again real soon, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. The Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for the Mountaintop Podcast.